something about the way you stare into my What's up guys and welcome back again to my YouTube channel. You are tuned in to Just Life With Me and I am Zaria. Nice to meet you if you are new here and if you are a returning subscriber, I thank you for coming back to my channel. I have been away guys. It has been a little crazy in the household but uh god is getting us through it he's working on me and um yeah everything is good over here so without further ado i want to get into what this video is about excuse me guys this video i'm not crying i promise this video is about why i left the icoc so just a little back uh history background history um the icoc is a um organization a church organization it stands for the international churches of christ and what it is is they pride themselves on being the one true church uh the church in acts um that is preaching the gospel uh people are getting saved and things of that nature right sounds good um however there are many red flags with this organization many um heresies with this organization and a lot of false um man-made things that are going on in this organization and uh, it is being considered a cult-like church so hopefully by the end of this video um somebody anybody uh if you are or have been a part of a cult a part of a christian cult in particular um this will give you some freedom some um urgency to leave so without further ado, I actually took notes in my journal, my notebook, and I'm going to go ahead and explain my story of why I left the ICOC. So uh, I left the ICOC in 2019. If you see me looking down, it's because I'm looking at my notes. I left the ICOC in 2019, uh, the tail end of that year. Um, I kind of faded to the back, if you will. So my journey with them um, began when I was 13 years old, uh, I was invited by my grandmother and my uncle who had been attending the church at that time. And, um, you know, I was happy to go because they basically told me, oh, well, there will be teenagers there your age that you can kind of like, you know, mix and mingle with. And I'm like, OK, cool, because at the church I was going to the youth that kind of like died out. So I was looking for a way out of that church anyway. So them telling me about the teens being there made me like light up with joy because I was like, oh, okay, maybe I can make some new friends. And so uh, I was 13 when I was drafted into the ICOC. Um, I was asked to study the Bible after teen camp. Now, at first I thought that studying the Bible meant that I was gonna go to a Bible study with a bunch of other girls my age. And boy, was that not the case. Um, and I'll get into a little bit of that later. But I actually um, agreed to do these Bible studies, to do these Bible studies, right? I didn't know that they were Bible studies. I thought they were just one Bible study and we'd all get together and just read the Bible together. You know, I was down for that. Um, but that was not the case. So I agreed to do these Bible studies and... Uh, in doing these Bible studies, okay, first and foremost, I was actually asked to study the Bible by my team minister at the time. Uh, she actually didn't live that far from me, and I found that out because I rode down to teen camp with her and her husband. So just to sidebar that. Um, and like I said, I thought that the Bible studies were just a regular Bible study because I came from a Baptist church, and I was used to going to Wednesday night Bible studies. So... Um, yeah, I remember there were a series of studies that they had me go through. And I remember going through these studies and mind you, I was baptized at the age of five. So um, at five years old, and I told them that, you know, I was baptized at five. So what they do is they give you these studies. They're called the principal studies, the first principal studies. And these are studies that are basically, I guess, vital to your Christian walk, um, to newborn Christians. I didn't know that at the time I was a child, right? So I got baptized at five already and I decided to now go to another church, go to a church camp and I was asked to study the Bible and I thought that that meant a Bible study, not Bible studies, and especially not studies that 
were geared towards me getting baptized because like I said, I was already baptized. So what ended up happening was um, I got coerced into believing that I wasn't a disciple, that I wasn't a Christian, um, that I needed these studies to get baptized again, re-baptized because I wasn't a Christian. And um, I went through these studies and based on my answers to these questions that they were asking me, they determined that I was not a Christian. Sounds crazy, right? It gets better. So um, these studies uh, that I went through, um, some of them were about counting the cost. So considering the cost of being a Christian, what it means to be a Christian. Um, there were some other, uh, some other kind of like confessions like I had to write down um all of my sins and I guess based on that you know I actually had my team minister tell me that I wasn't a disciple and um a disciple is basically a follower so in this case follower of Jesus and so that was the nickname that we were given was disciples um based on the 12 disciples that follow Jesus in the bible because if they got to keep up this persona that they are the one true church in acts then they have to follow along with everything. Uh, so you would think, but no. So um, they basically told me that, she basically told me that I wasn't a Christian um, based on those things and the way that I was responding to these questions. So anyways, I went through the studies, ended up getting baptized. And um, ironically, my mother got up and she said in front of the church, she was like, Zaria was already baptized at five. And I didn't remember that it didn't hit me until I was preparing for this video that my mom actually got up and said she was already baptized at five. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like at the time I was like embarrassing. But now that I think about it, my mom, she was right. She was right a little bit about them. Um, so, yeah, continuing in my notes, because I did write a lot of stuff down. So, after she convinced me to do these studies, and after she convinced me I wasn't a Christian, of course, I felt compelled to get baptized. I got baptized. My mother talked at my uh, baptismal, uh, at my baptism. She talked at it. And um, so, the only way that I thought that I could be a Christian, quote unquote, by their standards, was to get baptized. And I agreed to that. So um, they have this belief that if you are not baptized into their ministry, into their organization, then you aren't a Christian because they believe that they are the one true church. And because of that doctrine, man-made, that doctrine, they do not believe that any other church is Christians. They don't believe that people outside of the ICOC are Christians. They believe that if you're part of them, then you are part of the one true church, you're going to heaven. But if you're part of anybody else, you are going to hell. The body is made up of many members. That does not mean that those members, all of those members exist only in the ICOC. That means that the body is made up of many members and those members can be scattered throughout the four corners of the earth all over the place and that they could be a part of other churches possibly. So this whole idea of, oh, well, you know, if they're not a part of us, you shouldn't be bothered with them. Or if they're not a part of us, they're not Christians is a false accusation. And it has no proof and it's shown no merit and no credibility. And it is made up and it is man-made. And uh, yeah, it has caused a lot of issues. Um, I won't be the first one to come out and say this. And I definitely am not the first one. And I definitely won't be the last one either. So carrying on, um, yeah, so they have that belief and um, that they're the only church doing the will of God, um, which I now know is a bunch of foolery, but at the time I believed it um, and I was sold 100% on it um, until many years later when I realized that there were so many red flags that I did not see, so many red flags that I did not see. So I was baptized and I'm not gonna lie, I was on fire for God um so-called i was pumped i was excited i was in a new environment um 
a new experience from what I came from, which was a dead church. So I went from a dead church and then went into an even more dead church. Make that make sense, but yeah. So um, I was down, um, I was drawn in by the fact that they were, uh, they had team ministries. So I was drawn in by that. Cause like I said, I was, my, the church I came from, the team ministry had died out. The youth had died out. It was nothing but old people stuck in their traditions. So I was drawn in by this church and their team ministry and uh, the fact that it had youth in it. I could feel alive in it. So um, yeah, I quickly started learning that the ICOC, um, or my church's name was the Greater Cleveland Church of Christ. And um, I quickly started learning that these members were up under a certain type of order, a certain type of rules. Um, every decision made in their lives was, um, whether it be who you date, where you, um, what city you chose to live in, where you chose to attend college, because they also had a campus ministry, which was for the college kids, which was a branch off from the church. It was a sub branch off from the church. And uh, basically they chose like how you date it as well. So we were not allowed to date in uh, like single dates. We were not allowed to go on single dates. We had to go on group dates or encouragement dates, if you will. And um, I know a lot of people to this day who are not pleased with that, that are a part of the church. I'm not gonna mention no names, but there are some people that are not thrilled with that to this day. Uh, because how do you get to know somebody on a personal level if you are around other people there are questions that you want to ask them that you can't ask them because somebody else is sitting there in your mouth so yeah i digress on that one so yeah um this particularly became an issue for me um in fact it was the start of my rebellion and my downfall um i began to not like this at all and ultimately i grew miserable i was often um i'm sorry y'all trying to read my own notes Oh, I was often approached by guys in high school and, um, you know, and guys definitely took a liking to me, uh, not just in school, but I'm saying like, I wasn't saying I was the best looking, but, um, I had some love interest definitely. But, um, I remember one time I liked the guy and my team minister was like, well, what do you like about him? And I was like, oh, well, he's nice and smart. And she proceeded to tell me that he was not a disciple. Which kind of makes sense because, you know, if you like somebody and you of God, they need to be of God. You know, it kind of goes back to that scripture about not being unequally yoked. Because if you like somebody, if you date somebody, you date them to marry them, right? So my thing was, I got it. But I didn't get it. It made sense the way that she worded it. Oh, he's not a disciple. Why do you like somebody that's not of God? Okay. And I get it. However, it wasn't until many, many years later that I figured out it wasn't that he wasn't a disciple. It was the fact that he wasn't a part of our church and you deemed him not a disciple. Ding, 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 ding. Like red flag, red flag. Light bulb went off. So, um... I told her about the guy. She told me he wasn't a disciple. And I was like, oh, you know, that makes sense not to date someone who doesn't love God. Whatever. I got that. So at first, like I said, it made sense. But then I didn't learn to many years later um, that they only intended for us to date within the church. We could not date outside of the church because it goes back to that rule about them only being the one true church. And anybody outside of that is not of God. So we weren't allowed to date outside the church. And um, yeah, that was that. And they would, they would definitely like rebuke you for trying to do any of that. So, and I've, I've actually been around for some instances where that has happened as well. So um, this is where the idea of dating within the church stemmed from because we um, were the only one's doing the will of God. So you should only be with members of the church. And that was the first red flag. Um, like I stated before, it seemed to make sense. But at the time, when as time went on, um, I was like, the body is the church. They can't be the only ones. It's a billion people on the planet. They're all um, 
humanity has left, like that's not possible. So um, at getting salvation, that's not possible. Can't be possible. So yeah, um, I definitely started like seeing that as like, yeah, I need to get up out of here because I, I literally witnessed people in their 60s, 70s single. And it's because they couldn't find anybody in the church and they're gonna die single because of this doctrine. See how false it is? So at 15, I began to be real rebellious. I started hiding the little boyfriends and, um, you know, like I started hiding my little love interest. I didn't tell my parents that I had a boyfriend at the time. I didn't tell my discipler who, my, who was also my team minister at the time. I didn't tell anybody in the church. I kept all of that information to myself because I knew how they felt about dating outside the church. So that got me in a lot of trouble. Um, at 17, I got pregnant with my daughter. I got pregnant with my daughter and had to tell my close friends in the church. In fact, I had to get up in front of the church and tell the women that I was pregnant. Um, and basically ask for their forgiveness. Um, you know, which I was okay with. I was fine with that. Um, because that's what you're supposed to do. These women care for me and love me, and that's the least I could do. I was being deceitful the whole time. So so I did it, and, uh, you know, it was hard, but I did it. I was hiding the pregnancy from everyone, like I said, uh, for like five and a half months. And so I told everyone, and once I told everyone, it made it easier. It was less of a burden for me to carry, and I could carry out the rest of my pregnancy stress-free. So I did that. Um, fast forward to 2021, I began to really rebel, but secretly. So I saw many of my friends get married uh, and go on to build families. Meanwhile, I'm a single parent and lonely. I was extremely depressed at this time and no one knew I was suffering in silence. So yeah, I was suffering in silence. Uh, definitely, I, Single parenting is not really that common in the ICOC. A lot of people pride themselves on being married and they have a whole marriage ministry as well. And so there are things in place for the singles, but it's a 50-50 chance that you're actually going to meet somebody in the church, especially in the location that you're in, that likes you. And I was a single parent. A lot of the guys in there were fresh out of college. They weren't interested in me and nobody else. So yeah, there was that. So yeah. Um, I kept going to church even though I was spiritually dead and miserable and so depressed. Um, I kept attending church. My grandmother wouldn't let me live it down. She just kept coming in my room every Sunday. You going to church, you going to church. And if I said I'm not, she would just give me a whole lot of sass about it. So I kept going to church. Um, the church began to, be, to become more of like a routine to me. Um, all the rules and bondage I was in spiritually was a combination of why I no longer wanted to uh, be there, but because of me not wanting to, dis to basically like disappoint her um, and my uncle, the people who invited me there, I continued to go even though I knew I shouldn't uh, feel the way I feel about this church. And I, I knew that feeling because I had that feeling about my previous church. And when I started to feel that way about a church, it means that there's something wrong with that church. And I didn't realize that, that was a red flag as well. I didn't realize that until years later. So um, I knew I shouldn't feel that way about the church and I should be happy going there, but I just wasn't. Um, I now know why going to the church was miserable uh, experience for me after a while was because the Holy Spirit was not there. The Holy Spirit was not a part of this church. The Holy Spirit was not a part of my previous church. And that is why there was no life there. That is why I was spiritually dead. And then I was brought into a dead church again. See how that works? When you go to a spiritually dead church, you go there and you realize that you're spiritually dead. Eventually. Some people don't realize it. I was glad that God woke me up to see that I was spiritually dead. And he did it through things that weren't even spiritual. He did it through things that weren't even of him. All this man-made false doctrine that they came up with, none of that was in the Bible. Dating in groups, none of that is in the Bible. None of that ever happened or took place in the Bible. Man-made doctrine, man-made ideas, theologies. This is what 
they came up with to control people. And they still are around today and they still do these things. This is 2021 and I'm speaking out about something that happened for years. And because I was a child, you know you gotta go everywhere your, your parents go. I stayed, I had no choice, I went. But I was miserable and I was depressed. And I wouldn't say that I hold it against my leaders. They never actually did anything to me. They are new to my to my to my church because they we transfer we we get new pastors every five or six years. But what it was is that it's the the doctrine that's always been over the, the organization that has trickled down. And so every leader that comes in is just filling in the gaps from where the last one left off. You know, and it's because of the spirit that's over these churches that agree with this doctrine or that agree that the Holy Spirit is not active anymore. Crazy talk, crazy foolish talk. That is where a lot of um, a lot of my issues stem from, just the indoctrination and the doctrine that they came up with. That is not of God. So where was I? Where was I? Oh, there was not an inch of the Holy Spirit there. Um, not even in the pastors um, or the other leaders of the church. Um, I was going to the hospital sick, meaning I was going to the church sick and I was getting sicker. Um, I was dead spiritually because the church was bottom line and uh, I was spiritually dead and needed deliverance. And my pastor couldn't give me deliverance because he himself needs deliverance. Um, from the principality attached to the ICOC and uh, or principalities. Uh, so many other organizations or churches, um, you know, basically many non-denominational churches, uh, they have the similar spirit. Even if they're not a part of the ICOC, they have a similar spirit. And a lot of foolishness is going on in these particular churches. There are a lot of Christian cults going on in the world today and that's an issue for me jehovah's witnesses is a cult um mormons they are a cultic people a cultic group of um people and uh it needs to be stopped there are many others that i can mention but it needs to be stopped because i think a lot of people think they are doing doing the will of god but if you don't acknowledge the holy spirit that's a heresy if you um, are trying to control people and keep people under your command and not God's, that is someone who needs to be put down and stopped and exposed. And you don't need to be following those types of leaders, okay? So fast forward to the year 2020, which was just last year. Um, I'm completely removed mentally. And uh, especially after seeing all the signs, all the signs guiding me to leave, basically. Um, all, the, all the red flags. I first left mentally. So this is how I faded to the black. I first um, left mentally, then I left physically. So I left by fading to the black through my uncle. My uncle became sick and couldn't attend church anymore. And I kind of like used that as an opportunity to like skip out on church because I was already miserable and I was tired of going there. Everything became routine. So um, that was my opportunity to be at home, but that didn't last long because eventually I... Uh, did have to go back to church so then my grandfather became ill and his cancer became more aggressive he eventually passed away but i used that that was my permanent escape yes i did grieve my grandfather but his death was a permanent escape from the church because soon afterwards COVID hit and that was even more reason not to be around them um, and in that same year, he died in December, but that's that following year, January 7th, I remember this, we buried him. And I ended up getting married to my now husband, April 17th, 2020 of that same year. So I was trying to escape a spiritual death. Um, I had to get out of there. I was spiritually dead and I was trying to escape that death. And uh, so I faded out in stages. And mainly because they make you feel like if you leave the church, then you leave God. That's why it was so hard for me to leave. And I also, I couldn't leave because I was a child. You know, and your parents make you go everywhere that they go. And they don't see what you see. And a lot of people, and this is for people who grew up in the kingdom, kingdom kids, okay, as they call them. 
I know how hard it is for you to leave. If your parents are the ushers, the elders of the church, the people over the men's ministry, the women's ministry, pastors, um, evangelists, all of those things, uh, your, your parents lead worship, all of those things will make it hard for you to leave because you have woken up to the three-headed monster that is the ICOC. And now you were woke and you realize that they still sleep. And it's hard because you're a child and you're up under them. And they want you to follow in their footsteps and join the church, so-called. But you have already awoken to, that's not what I want to do. You see something in them that is wrong. You are not wrong. You are 100% correct. If you want to leave a cult, a cult-like church, and it is hard for you, if you are a child, obviously you will have to wait till you're older because some people cannot just leave when they want to leave. But if you are an adult, and this is for my, my people 18 and older, you have a choice over your life. God wants to do better for you. Uh, God wants you to do better and he wants you to do better in him. He wants to um, build you up and give you his spirit. And that church does not have it. Um and to reiterate what I just said, because I think I messed up a little bit on that. God wants to see better for you. He wants your life to be full of his grace and mercy and his spirit. Not for you to be spiritually dead. When you come into a hospital and you're sick, you come in there to get well. You don't come in there to leave sicker. I didn't come into the ICOC because I wanted to be dead spiritually. I came because I thought, this place would promote hope in me. And I thought that this was a church that would be a new start for me. And it wasn't. It was the beginning of a lot of troubles for me. And uh, if it had been a, a church that was up under the Holy Spirit, I believe a lot of decisions that I made in my life would not have been made um, if it was not for this church. I definitely believe that. If I had some leadership and guide, and guide, um, guiding from the Holy Spirit that I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been in the places that I've been in, in the situations that I've gotten into.